Clark College Foundation inspires the joy of philanthropy in support of student success and program excellence at Clark College. As part of our efforts to engage our alumni and supporters in this mission, we've established the Clark College Foundation Alumni Relations Presents. Its purpose is to highlight the work and careers of alumni. Alumni are real examples of the impact of Clark College in their lives and the community. Welcome to today's edition of Clark College Foundation Alumni Relations Presents. Creating Super Green Cities, featuring our special guest, Dennis Hayes, a 1964 alumnus of Clark College. Thank you for attending. I'm Ed Boston, Director of Alumni Relations, Clark College Foundation. We thank you for submitting your questions in advance and we'll do everything possible to get them answered during the program. So welcome to today's edition. I am delighted to have the privilege and the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Dennis Hayes. We have the rare opportunity to engage one of Clark College's Outstanding Alumni Award recipients and internationally renowned alumnus, Dennis Hayes, class of 1964 from Camas, Washington. He's a scholar, an author, an innovator, and so much more. He is well-decorated with countless awards, honors, and recognition. Dennis was the inspirational organizer of the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970. Today, as the CEO of the Pacific Northwest Conservation Group, the Bullet Foundation in Seattle, Washington, the innovator focuses on how to build resilient cities with green living buildings that rely less on petroleum resources. He is steadfast in his belief that people can create technological innovations to solve environmental challenges. In doing so, he believes we can pass on a diverse habitable planet to the next generations. We'll have opening remarks by Dennis. Welcome Dennis, take it away. Hi Ed, thank you very much for those gracious introductory remarks. I'm gonna keep this first part relatively brief since I think we're running just a little bit late and we'd like to get to the questions and answers. But first I do wanna say it's it's always a pleasure to come back and have some contact with Clark. I'm, I'm getting to be that age where I, I love revisiting my youth. Um, Clark was a very important institution for me. I was one of those people who graduated from high school, really not quite ready for the world. Uh, I grew up in Camas. Uh, my, my parents were, were pretty much homebodies. Uh, we, would, we would go to Portland a few times a year, but that was kind of a trip for us. It was, it was exceptional to go to Portland. Uh, Emmanuel Kant apparently never traveled more than about 12 miles from the house where he was born. And I was giving Emmanuel Kant a little bit of a run for his money in my early years. Um, after leaving Clark, I, I had the, the great good fortune to be able to go to a number of quite fine institutions. I, I did my undergraduate work at Stanford and also went to Stanford Law School and Business School and to Harvard for the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, but I can say that the some of the teachers that I had at Clark were as superb as any teachers that I've ever encountered anywhere. Took a, a real interest in the students, took a real interest in me. I got to be on a first name basis with them and, and to really, as a result of uh, probing questions, started to ask a whole lot of probing questions about the assumptions that I had sort of taken on faith before then. It was really the uh, the first part of my intellectual awakening. After I, I left Clark, and, and this does actually relate to deep green cities, um, I'll, I'll try to get to that point quickly. I went off hitchhiking around the world for, for three years, basically in a, a quest to find some meaning in life. And as part of that process, uh, I hitchhiked all over Africa, down the uh, west coast, back up the east coast, all throughout the Middle East, South Asia, Southwest Asia, 
uh, Southeast Asia, uh, places where I would, I would be shot on sight today in Iraq and Iran and Syria. Um, it was a, a profoundly important period for me, but of relevance to tonight's talk was really a, um, an awakening that I had to something that 50 years later, almost 60 years later now seems um, pretty obvious. And that was that we human beings are, are animals and we live inside ecosystems just like all other animals do. And that while everything else on earth is largely governed by the unavailability of abundant energy, uh, virtually all of the energy currency of life on the planet is sunlight, a relatively diffuse source that's captured through quite inefficient processes of photosynthesis that range from one and a half to maybe as much as 4% efficiency in their capture, and then liberated through oxidative phosphorylation into all of the things that allow us to function, to perform work, allow life on the planet to, to work. Um, and the insight that I had one night, and it was in Namibia, is that the difference between us and everything else, and there are various differences, we're, we're clever, we have opposable thumbs, we have all of that, but a big difference was that we had tapped into relatively cheap, abundant energy, and that that had given us some opportunities, um, and we had taken full advantage of some of those and abused others. And that partly as a consequence of that, we were getting ourselves into an increasing number of environmental problems. And in that whole night of sort of wrestling with what we would now call um, urban ecology, industrial ecology, human ecology, we didn't really have a vocabulary for it at the time, I began to wonder how life on the planet might function if we too made a conversion away from reliance upon fossil fuels into a reliance upon solar energy and what that would mean for the nature of our cities and for the nature of our buildings, our transportation systems, our, our industry. Um, another way of asking that question is what happens if we were to model our cities upon ecosystems? Now, ecosystems are very different depending upon where they're located. You, you should not build, you would, you would not find an ecosystem in Phoenix that is like an ecosystem in Vancouver, Washington. And yet, because we've had this cheap, abundant energy, we have tried to build pretty much exactly the same cities in Phoenix that we do in Vancouver or Portland. And what would happen if, if we didn't? if we took full advantage of what was available in each place and structured it in a fashion that um, was appropriate to the precise regional area where it's located. In any case, that, I, I didn't come to any conclusions. I was you know, 19 years old, just trying to think my way through all of this. But I, I came out of that night basically with a commitment that I've lived with, that I've, I've spent much of my life trying to explore this. Without going into too great detail, let me just sort of say that that has led to things like a building that I built up in Seattle, the cloudiest major city in the contiguous 48 states, uh, that is six stories tall and that gets as much energy from the sunshine that falls on its roof as it uses for all purposes, uh, the space conditioning of the building and, and all of the needs of six stories of tenants. I emphasize six stories because you've got the same amount of roof to harvest sunlight on if you're one story or six stories or 50 stories. To do that for six stories, it, it, it turns out seven years after we built it, we remain the only true net energy positive six story office building in the world. And um, that is very much like the Douglas fir forest that used to be up where we now have Seattle, which got all of its energy uh, from the sun, the energy for its plants, and then the energy from the animals that ate those plants and the animals that ate those animals. Um, and, and similarly, we get all of the water for the bullet center, including potable drinking water and the showers and the toilets, all from the rain that falls on the rooftop and that uh, is stored in a large cistern and then purified. Uh, the ecosystems that were there before did not produce toxic substances that would remain forever to the extent there may have been uh, a few snakes and other things that produced venom that's all biodegradable. And we made sure in our building that we contain nothing that was uh, going to be carcinogenic or mutagenic or toxic in any way. 
I, I guess I could go on. The, the important thing I'm trying to say here is that if you design your cities around the needs of a species, like you do it with complete reference to the weather conditions, the climate conditions, the availability of natural resources in its immediate era, you start to get a very different kind of city than the cities that we've produced. And cities that have been trying to engage in this biomimicry, like Copenhagen, uh, Amsterdam, Freiburg, uh, Oslo, uh, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, have been doing some fascinating experiments, some of which we might talk about tonight. And, um, and I guess that's the heart of what I was trying to communicate here, is that if we pay attention to what was in the location that we have built our cities in before those cities were created, and design them in a way that is appropriate to their circumstances, we can build things that are much less resource intensive and much more resilient to the world around them. When I got started on all of this, this was all about trying to avoid consumption of resources and production of pollution. We were trying to avoid, among other things, climate change. As we see repeatedly now, most emphatically in the last week or so down in Texas, we also have the added benefit if we build them that way that we're building cities that are far more resilient and able to take care of themselves in this changed, diminished, if you will, environmentally impoverished world that we have been creating. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I, I, I must say that I could uh, just continue to listen to you and learn uh, more and more and uh, expand my thinking about what we could actually do to bring about uh, super green cities. So, uh, We've enlisted uh, the assistance of two students. One is the Clark College alumna, uh, and the other is the current student to serve as moderators tonight. We have Kenya, who has completed her biology program at Clark and graduated high school, all in 2020. Justin, on the other hand, will be graduating this year after completing all of the requirements to enter an elementary education bachelor's program. We're delighted to have them join us and uh, Kenya and Justin, take it away. Um, hey, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna start off with some of the questions. So you had said that Seattle's Bullet Center was deemed the greenest commercial building in the world at the time it was built. And you've said that you hoped it, that would not change in less than a decade. 2021 marks 10 years since construction began on the Bullet Center. Is it still the greatest building in the world or are you seeing examples of this type of building or perhaps even more innovative designs in cities around the world? Uh, great question. Uh, we, we had this idea uh, and it turned out to be wrong that the biggest obstacle to having deep green buildings was, was simply that people thought they weren't possible. In fact, we went around talking to a number of uh, real estate developers in Seattle before we embarked on the project and asked them whether you could, in fact, among other things, make a net energy neutral or a net energy negative building that was six stories tall in Seattle. And to a person, they said, it's just impossible. Uh, you wouldn't even be able to get enough electricity to meet the plug loads of your tenants, much less operate the building too. Um, so we figured, okay, well, if we can do it and if we can make it affordable and make it make, show economic sense and show that it's attractive enough that, that we would have a, a long list of uh, people requesting to come in as future tenants, uh, that it would then be replicated. And, and it wasn't. Uh, it's a very, very um, conservative industry People tend to try to build buildings that are very much like the ones they've already done and they know that they work and they don't have any great desires to, to take risks. And um, we've tried giving incentives to get them to take risks and uh, <laughs> that hasn't worked either. We, we've passed things that give them extra stories, they give them accelerated approval times, they give them access to more money. Uh, and in the end, it turns out that 99% of the buildings in America are built to code. And if you think about it, that is the worst possible building that you can build without breaking the law. Uh, but that's where we tend to be. 
um, people do what is required of them. And I should say that's been something that's been very successful in a number of European countries and is in a place like Brussels, turns out now all new buildings in Brussels um, have to meet passive code design. That's, that's one of the most energy efficient voluntary programs in the world and Brussels has now made it mandatory. Uh, the quick answer though is, is now there are several dozen super green buildings in different parts of the world. They are very different in Atlanta uh, and in uh, Melbourne, Australia than they are in Seattle. Uh, but they were designed for their particular ecosystems and they're performing really quite well. The next question I have, uh, job growth is one way many people measure the viability of a project. Do current plans for creating super green cities address not only new job creation for builders, but also how to retrain those in the architectural field to become part of the solution? Would retraining help minimize job losses that may happen as standards change? Mm -hmm. Terrific question. Um, you know, a, a, a huge shift that has been occurring over the last 20 years in general and over the last five to 10 years with greater emphasis is a focus upon the equity dimensions of, of environmental change. That if you're going to be creating a bunch of new jobs that, uh, that you are training a much more diverse labor force than you have historically. Uh, we, we made this an important part of the, the requirements that we gave to the subcontractors that built the bullet center. And, and it, it is something that I think is now becoming uh, increasingly common in the United States. And we, we certainly have a way to go, but it, it's, it's become a natural part now of doing business. Uh, interestingly, you asked about architects. Uh, they are probably the least in need of retraining and and especially young ones who are within the last 10 or 15 years having come out of architecture school, for the most part, they, they know how to build things that are super green and they would love to design things that are out at the bleeding edge. The difficulties are one, banks don't wanna finance it and real estate development is all about leverage. Developers tend to be risk averse and so they tend not to try to do something that is very different from what they have done before. And to successfully build a truly deep green building, and this is where your retraining comes in, maybe most emphatically, the actual work people who do it, the carpenters, the masons, the plumbers, the electricians, have to pay incredible attention to quality. You can't have the kinds of variances, a, a quarter of an inch gap that runs the entire length of the building that would not be uncommon in conventional uh, construction. Uh, every time that we brought a new set of folks in to work on the bullet center, I, I, I pulled them in for this little 10-minute um, pep talk. And I, I'd show, among other things, the, the big poster we've all seen of the guys sitting on a girder that are eating their lunch uh, while they're uh, building the Golden Gate Bridge in California. And I said, they're, they're smiling, right? That's not because their lunch is super delicious. It's because this is a group of people who know that they are doing something that has never done, been done before. And that's gonna to have to do it with quality, that the whole world is watching them. In our own little modest way with this building, we are trying something that has never been done before. It has to be done with quality. Any of you makes a big gap, uh, you'll destroy the effectiveness of the entire project. I'd like you to each go into this with something as though you were going to sign it after you'd completed your work and bring your family and your friends to show what you've done. Uh, and that almost more than the actual retraining aspect is really it. So it's a concern with taking care of quality. Well, I'm going to pass it on to Justin and he's going to ask you some more questions. Justin. Thank you, Kenya. Hello, Dennis. I'm hey. Justin, your second moderator. Over the last 10, 15 years, giant leaps were made in thermal depolarization, a process which removes plastics from landfills and turns them into resources such as fuel. However, it never gets much traction in green investment areas as it's deemed too expensive. Are not all resources expensive at some level? As the technology becomes more available for a resource, the cost goes down. So why not thermal depolarization of consumer, farm, and commercial waste? Um. 
I'm going to broaden your question to to not just the particular technology, but but to the whole field of materials use and reuse and combustion. When you are talking about, in, in your particular instance, the um, polymers that can be withdrawn from waste dumps and can be combusted as a source of energy and fuel to maybe produce electricity and then use the low-grade heat that's left over to power other processes and maybe even put some of the carbon dioxide into greenhouses. All of that is something that is being done in various parts of the world, some of it in pilot plants and some of it in other countries relatively commonly. Um, and it's probably been a good thing uh, as an intermediate step. But the material that you're pulling out to combust was all made from petroleum. When you burn it, you're going to be producing carbon dioxide. And the entire world is now on a trajectory. I mean, doing it that way and getting multiple bounces off of it, you get a plastic product and then you get a source of electricity and then you get some low grade heat and you get some uh, CO2 for your greenhouse is better than simply having the plastic and throwing it in a, in a landfill. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to do is design a system which is not going to be producing combustible plastics out of, out of oil. Um, the, th this is something that is often dealt with in, in sort of sweeping terms like I just have and that, that ignore the complexities of the requirements of the physical world. But we have in recent times seen more and more international focus upon what is termed the circular economy, where once a product is pulled out of the ground, uh, it remains in commerce basically forever. And you can get it, then you reuse it, and then you uh, re-engineer it and retorque it and recycle it and, and ultimately just keep it going. That's obviously much easier for metals than it is for, um, uh, for example, wood. Uh, but as an aspirational goal, keeping it in circulation, I think is preferable to combusting it. Next question. It takes energy to build super green cities. There will never be enough wind turbines, solar panels, or other green energy sources to sustain the globe's energy needs. What are the major energy producing resources that are needed to meet our future global demands? And why did you choose those particular resources? <laughs> well, um, alas, I have spent my entire life, at least since 1974 or 75, um, attacking the presumptions that underpin the question. Uh, the solar resource is an absolutely extraordinary resource, as is wind, capable of producing thousands of times more commercial power than human civilization uses for all purposes. The difficulties are that it's intermittent and it's relatively diffuse. And sometimes it's not exactly where it is that you want to be consuming the power. You've got a lot of wind in Wyoming and a lot of people in Chicago got a lot of sunlight in Arizona, but you don't want to be moving more and more people to a water scarce area. But it's possible to put together transmission things, storage facilities that can handle all of that. And I, I do think that ultimately, and by ultimately, that's now getting to be a shorter and shorter horizon. Um, certainly by 2050, the world is going to be 90% plus uh, getting its energy from renewable resources. Dominantly solar and wind, although we'll continue to produce a little bit more hydro than we are today. I think we're going to be seeing more and more geothermal, particularly deep geothermal coming online. Um, and then finally, the, the, the thing that always gets overlooked in these conversations, but let me stomp on it with both feet. Going back to that night in Africa, when I was thinking about the super efficiency with which nature uses energy because energy is relatively costly. We have to make these investments in efficiency. The, the, whole, the whole concept of waste as a source of status has to somehow be abandoned. Uh, the, the fact that in order to get from one point to another, you're going to be driving a two-ton sports utility vehicle to transport a 160-pound person is just 
literally crazy. And, and much of the world is now moving away from that. And you're seeing it with super efficient electric vehicles, Norway, interestingly, being, as everybody who watched the Super Bowl knows, uh, the global leader on that. But if we can drive the energy demands down to ways that it makes sense and uh, do that in a fashion that, that uh, also distributes storage, distributes um, control technologies uh, broadly across the society. There, there's just no question but that the solar and the wind resource base is far more than ample to meet that. An interesting thing that's happening now in, in Eastern Washington and also in Maryland is the use of agricultural lands as solar resources as well. We, we've long seen wind turbines going up and cows grazing underneath them. There's no reason that they're not completely compatible with how the land was used before. But we're also now seeing that row crops are being uh, grown underneath solar panels and there's enough diffuse light coming in from around them to be able to have as much agricultural production as before and yet having that space available to produce electricity and feeding it into the grid. Uh, so I, I, that was a roundabout way to say, I think we can get there and that uh, we can get there in a fairly speedy fashion. I think I can understand that. It seems very encouraging that there are places that have a lot of resources for all the power that wind, that wind and solar can produce, although a challenge to have to rise up and meet transferring that energy. Now, we're going to go back to Kenya. So my question is, is there a nexus between creating green cities and fighting homelessness in our cities? If so, what are the key connection points, either positive or negative, to be considered? Yeah, uh, and, and we might make that even more difficult by saying, is there a way that some of the funds that are going to be spent on economic stimulation and infrastructure development after COVID-19 can also be applied to all of this? Obviously, to the extent that you can pursue multiple goals simultaneously, uh, you're, you're far better off. The answer to homelessness is to build more homes. If the desire is to build the cheapest thing you possibly can, uh, which may last 20 years and may use five times as much energy as it ought to if it were constructed well, you can build more of those than you can of the final. And so rather than a nexus, there's a, a potential conflict. And it can only be resolved by finding enough resources to build quality domiciles to meet the full needs of people. Again, I don't mean to be glib about that because we have, the world has a series of tsunamis, population tsunamis coming toward it. We're seeing that already a little bit in Europe now as it's responding to refugees from Syria and from Iraq and the, the turbulence that is there. Uh, we're now gonna be seeing more and more climate refugees as uh, some of the coastal areas of the world are inundated by rising oceans. Uh, as people are living in areas that have become too hot and too parched to sustain life. And as they try to move into other places, uh, somehow we need to be building enough infrastructure in those places to accommodate these waves and to do it in a, in a fashion that everyone finds politically acceptable. Uh, as, as you've seen in the United States, which historically has been the most welcoming country in the world to immigrants, uh, hands down, without really any serious competition. Uh, we, we've become enormously hostile to immigration and the last presidential administration rose that to even, even greater heights. If you were to take that and you put it into a culture like Japan's, uh, a culture uh, like uh, China's, uh, where there's genuine hostility to the concept of even small trickles of foreign people coming in and joining the society, it becomes very difficult. Uh, Europe, which was relatively welcoming and where uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, was, was basically uh, opening her arms to a million immigrants from the Middle East in a remarkably generous fashion. It just caused this incredible wave of backlash and the rise of right-wing nationalist parties that threatened a, a very successful politician's future. Uh, so this is not going to be easy, uh, but uh, as you build new things, you always have the option to build it right, and I hope we are now getting smart enough that we're going to start doing that. Now, how can we ensure that Indigenous knowledge of tending the land 
is centered and prioritized when considering the land's needs and all its inhabitants as we move toward a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you get political for 10 seconds, one nice step would be to confirm Deb Holland as Secretary of Interior and have the first Native American ever to be in a cabinet and in charge of the department that has the most responsibility for indigenous peoples. Uh, I'm, I'm really quite appalled at the opposition that seems to be boiling up against her. She's, she's really, she would be truly excellent. Uh, at, at the broader level, when I was talking about uh, what we can learn from hundreds of millions of years of beta testing by mother nature as we design cities and industrial processes and transportation systems, um, much of that is the same as indigenous knowledge. They, they were people who lived on the land in ways that were uh, not dependent upon petroleum, not dependent upon nuclear, not even dependent upon coal. They, they lived lives that uh, were very light on the planet. And uh, they have managed for the most part to continue to do that in places where we haven't deprived them of the necessary resources to do it. Um, I, I think uh, we're seeing it play out right now, interestingly, in the Northwest in our treatment of salmon, where indigenous populations which have basically had salmon as the heart of their diets and the hearts of their culture for millennia uh, are trying like crazy to stop a form of development that is going to be destroying the wild salmon population has already been in some large measure undermining it. Um, learning from it is merely a matter of opening our eyes and our ears. They're more than willing to teach and they have been remarkably patient as we have kind of been destroying the places that that, that they love. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to pass it over to Justin again for some more questions. What are the implications of global warming, overpopulation, and the increasing divide between rich and poor for the future of stable social living? Hey. <laughs> I, I should have demanded to look at these questions ahead of time. That is a, that's, that, that's a real stunner. Um, we, we have, I mean, let, let me not avoid the bleakness. Whenever humanity has experienced what is a genuine revolution, by which I mean the agricultural revolution, uh, the industrial revolution, the digital revolution, uh, we have invariably had greater concentrations of wealth in the aftermath of it. You, know, it, you, you didn't have the ability to build pyramids and everybody was hunting and gathering. You didn't have the Carnegies and the Rockefellers until you had an industrial revolution. And you didn't have the Gateses and Bezoses and, and uh, Musks until you had a digital revolution. Um, as we move now into what will be a true energy revolution, uh, because dealing with the first of your things, climate change, uh, is going to be requiring that, that, that we really have a fundamental change in the way that we get energy, where we get it from and how we use it once we've pulled it out. Um, it has been critical to the folks who have been for the longest time, most aggressively pushing for that revolution, that it not have that same um, aspect that previous revolutions have of, of making a handful of people fabulously wealthy and uh, the greater number of people uh, poorer than they were before. Uh, I, I think that that may well happen more easily with this than it has in previous instances because uh, renewable resources, with the exception of the giant offshore wind turbines, which really do require massive corporations to build something that's gonna be having blades the length of two football fields spinning in a quarter of a mile of water. But solar in particular, geothermal, the, the other investments in efficiency are, are all modular and distributable. They can be made on a relatively small scale. They are distributed across the society and the income from them uh, can be kept close at home. Uh, so I, I, one of the ways that, 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 um, disparity and wealth has occurred is when there is a big distance between the place where production takes place and where consumption takes place. And to the extent that all of that takes place in the same area, I, I think one, it, 
It has good effects upon pollution. It has very good effects upon income distribution. And, and I, I think it will lead to far greater resilience because you're caring about the community that you're building in. None of that addresses the middle of your questions, which is population. And that, that remains the, the, the tough thing that we've never figured up a, a good way to uh, satisfactorily, speedily address. I mean, if you had a very long time and you were thinking that a global population of 10 or 11 billion would be satisfactory, then simply uh, giving women around the world access to education and access to birth control and access to sources of status other than being mothers. Uh, in societies where that has happened, you've seen the birth rates just plummet. Uh, the difficulty is that to get that to happen overnight has not proven to be very easy. So I, I think it will happen in the natural course of things. I'm afraid it's going to happen with population levels that we are going to be having great difficulties sustaining, uh, at least sustaining at a material level of consumption that people think of uh, in the United States or in Europe or Japan uh, or China as a middle class. Um, there, it, it's often said there's no population problem uh, in China. Uh, the population problem is in the United States where we have all of this consumption. And the answer to that has always been that's true as long as you have a billion Chinese who are prepared to be peasants forever. But it turned out once they had the opportunity not to, even Chinese peasants did not want to be Chinese peasants. They wanted to climb that ladder, wanted to eat more meat, wanted to have access to more creature comforts. And uh, that becomes extremely difficult with any technologies that we can currently envision for a population of 10 billion people. That makes sense. Yeah, it, it's clear that environmental issues really are humanitarian issues too. Uh, how do you feel about corporations increasingly stepping in to address social and environmental issues? <laughs> well, it depends on which side they're stepping in on, uh, but we'll, we'll take all of the uh, help that we can get. You know, for, for a very long time, the environmental movement here and in most countries really consisted of a group of uh, citizens uh, working in public interest organizations uh, in concert with governmental authorities and with the courts uh, to try to hold profit-making companies to improve their, um, their behavior. So we would pass a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, a Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, uh, an Endangered Species Act, a Marine Mammal Conservation Act, a Toxic Substances Control Act, and on and on, and place that framework around corporate behavior so that as everybody's following the same rules, either willingly or under a threat of a lawsuit, um, everybody has to be operating in a fashion that, that makes things better. That has been shifting in the last few years as a political faction in the United States and in some other countries has become increasingly, uh, tragically anti-environmental. And um, at the same time that that has been taking place, a number of corporate executives are becoming increasingly concerned with sustainability and concerned with having companies that will be enduring for the next 20, 30, 50 years and recognize that they have to improve their behavior if that's going to happen. And so now it's, it's sort of strange we find the development of what they call ESG uh, uh, concerns in the stock market, it's environmental, social, and governance concerns, uh, which is by far the most exciting thing really taking place today in uh, the analytical community for hedge funds and for mutual funds and for others. There, there are now, I think in the United States, something on the order of 40 or $50 trillion that are invested in ESG portfolios. And that's for companies that for the most part are prepared to take these things somewhat more seriously. I, I don't want to suggest that many CEOs are going to be confused with John Muir or James Audubon. I mean, they, they still are about the bottom line and they need to view themselves as uh, giving a reasonable return to their shareholders. But increasingly they view their shareholders as one of the parties that they must serve. And they also care about their workforces, about their consumers and about the communities that they live in. 
And I, I think that's just an enormously positive step forward. I personally, I found it very comforting learning about things like the Safe Water Act and what the country has already done to try to protect us. And I get from what you're saying, yeah, activists, people who try to raise awareness and to persuade others that issues need to be addressed are very important. Thank you. Back to you, Kenya. If, if I could say just one more thing about that as, as, as examples, because I was a little bit abstract as I was making those claims, but uh, Microsoft has uh, pledged that it will be net carbon neutral by 2030. And by 2050, it will have been sufficiently carbon negative that it will have taken out of the atmosphere as much carbon as it has put into the atmosphere during its entire corporate existence. Uh, General Motors, which as recently as last December was actually supporting a Trump lawsuit to try to undercut the clean air uh, obligations and the greenhouse gas obligations imposed by the state of California, dramatically reversed course and has now said that it will produce no cars that use internal combustion or diesel engines after 2035, which in the corporate world to change a corporation the size of General Motors is just an incredibly short timetable. And this is a massive conversion. And, and so there are now things that are coming along that are not just the little, we're gonna recycle our uh, packing containers. We're gonna have everybody in our lunchroom use porcelain cups that they can wash. We're, we're talking about serious fundamental corporate commitments that are coming from a few places. They still have to deliver but at least they're moving in, in the right direction and making very good sounding pledges. And now the last question for me, um, would you say it's more or less challenging to get people to go green now than in the 1970s? Um, and this includes both young and old, older. I'd say it's actually mm, quite a bit easier today. Uh, the, with, with a caveat that I'll put on after I've address that a little bit. In, in 1970, uh, the environment really wasn't much of a thing. Uh, we had people who were worried because of Silent Spring about pesticides, uh, because of uh, uh, Santa Barbara about oil spills, because of Cleveland and the Cuyahoga River about rivers catching on fire. And they were worried about the Great Lakes dying. They were worried about threats to whales and to uh, a wide variety of birds. Um, and they were very opposed to freeways cutting through vibrant inner city areas where there were these really, really strong communities and suddenly there's going to be eight lanes of concrete right through the middle of it. But somehow all of those things were not tied together in one bundle so that they were all working on one another's issues. But what we did with that first Earth Day was to take all of those individual strands and weave them into modern environmentalism. And once that happened, then we began to be able to proselytize. And in particular, we, we worked very hard with teachers in K-12 schools to start getting environmental education to be more widespread. One of the things that has always been true is that parents want to be heroes to their kids. They want their kids to look up at them, up to them. And um, if your kid comes home from school and asks, you know, why are we using LED lamps? Uh, why are we so wasteful in our use of water? Uh, are, are we still uh, using natural gas to heat our, our water? Uh, the, the parents are, are going to be trying to see if, if there's some relatively easy way that they can do something that will make their kid admire them. I mean, today the hot thing is if you can do it, uh, buy an electric vehicle and put some solar panels on your roof and, and get your automobiles basically run by the sun. Uh, which turns out to be increasingly affordable. And there are more and more, I think there's like 20 models of electric vehicles now in the United States, and it's increasing by a dozen or so every year. Um, so that, that, that began with a vengeance in 1970, and it has continued until today. And now we have all of those people that were in school in 1970, uh, often in positions of power, uh, in, including in politics and in, in, and in corporate America. What we did not have then that we have today is a uh, segment of the population, even a sizable segment that for political reasons takes pride in being anti-environmental. 
1970, if you were anti-environmental, you were sort of ashamed of it. <laughs> and even company heads that were fighting, I mean, you know, we, we now talk about passing the Clean Air Act. Passing the Clean Air Act was done in opposition to the petroleum industry, the coal industry, the natural gas industry, the automobile industry, the steel industry, the electric utility industry. I mean, almost anybody with power in the United States was fighting against that um, and doing it as obliquely as they could because they didn't want to be anti-environmental, but boy, they threw all the money they could in, to try and to defeat that in Congress. And what opposed them was this rising up of people that were just tired of having air that they couldn't breathe without gasping and choking and and didn't want their, you know, one of the things that came out was this recognition that in Los Angeles, breathing was the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And it hit mothers that that meant that their six month old babies were smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And they were just outraged. It became uncontrollable. So the Clean Air Act, despite all of that opposition, passed unanimously both houses of Congress. That's the sort of outpouring that we were able to generate. Today, you can't get anything unanimously through Congress. So I think we've got more people who truly understand environmental issues now and support them. Um, but we also have a, a fierce opposition that we're going to have to overcome. All right, Dennis, this is the biggest question of the afternoon. And that's saying a lot because of all the other questions. What can Clark College do to better foster the ambitions of students who wish to pursue the climate sciences? Um, well, a whole lot. I mean, the, the environment is now thoroughly integrated throughout the curriculum, and it's possible to come up with an entire lengthy reading list of uh, literature that is around environmental themes, some of it very profound and provocative. There is um, a whole field of ecological economics, and uh, to the extent that you've got uh, economists on the faculty, it would be good to try to reach out and, and make sure that at least one of them is teaching uh, ecological economics. And, and you can do that pretty much straight across the board with every topic that you have. Uh, there are environmental historians, there are environmental lawyers, there are environmental everything today. So that at, at the teaching level, it, it should be possible for a student to enter Clark uh, with a decent high school background and leave Clark really very well versed on the environmental implications of whatever subjects it is that of most interest to him or her. Uh, second thing that can be done is, is Clark is itself a collection of buildings. It's people who use some kind of transportation to get to the college every day, and, uh, who eat a certain kind of food. And, and all of that is uh, it, itself a, a set of choices that are being made. Uh, I. I don't know anything at all about the heating, cooling, insulation, windows, anything at the Clark College's buildings, except that I would be willing to bet my house and my retirement portfolio that it would be economically sensible for Clark to make a set of investments that have it use half as much energy as it currently does. And um, that's something that students could get into, dig into, ask the questions. Uh, get your faculty to work with you on doing the analysis and then take it to the board and to whoever the officials are that oversee Clark to have them invest more in, in their individual facilities. Uh, when you're uh, buying things at a cafeteria or bringing food from home, uh, it, it turns out that after buildings and transportation, food is the, the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions and overall environmental destruction in the country. We tend to ignore food, but it's really important. And, you know, you go, you go around Europe and basically at every street corner, you can, you can buy organic produce, buy organic uh, snack foods, buy organic lunches. The United States, it's it's getting more common. We now have a number of stores that are making that a, a natural part of something, at least a choice that consumers can make. But you ought to do that in, in your school cafeteria as well and make sure that anything that is wasted is that is not used by the end of the day is, is either delivered uh, to somebody who needs it, composted or something, that none of that goes into the into the trash. Um, find the most efficient way to get your body from home to college. Um, it, 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 the whole thing, I, I suppose, comes down to a matter of 
integrity. Uh, when Mahatma Gandhi was trying to bring about heroic changes in India, he quite famously said that the ends are the means in the making. Uh, you, you have to live the values it is that you're proclaiming. And if you do that, one, you are more motivated yourself to give it your all. But second, nobody viewing you is going to see you as a hypocrite. But if you uh, to take a, a fairly famous example of something that I was involved in a discussion, a heated discussion about a couple of days ago, to the extent that some very wealthy person with very good intentions goes to United Nations climate conference in a chartered, not a chartered, an owned private aircraft uh, that's, that's basically carrying three people from the United States across to Paris. Uh, that, that, that's the height of hypocrisy. And uh, Clark can do its own small steps across the way and every student can to make sure that the lives that they are leading are uh, congruent with their, with their values. Bondi was definitely right about what he said. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. That is the last question Kenny and I have. Now we're going back to Ed to say a few final words. Dennis, thank you so much for being here to provide additional insights into creating super green cities. The Clark College Penguin Nation is extremely proud of you and your support of Clark College and the community. We applaud you for your unwavering commitment to creating super green cities. A special thanks goes to Kenya and Justin for moderating this very informative and timely subject. Well done. Dennis, I know I leave here today better informed about what I can personally do to help in creating super green cities. Again, thank you. I also want to acknowledge a cast of support by students, Amber and Caitlin. They provided assistance throughout the program. And again, a special thanks to them. We also had assistance from faculty members. Director Delalia Paredes, Professor Michelle Stockcloser, Professor Kathleen Perilla, and also colleagues at the College Foundation were all involved in making this program a reality. The program was recorded and you will receive a follow-up email with the YouTube link for the recorded program. A big thanks goes to all of you for your time and interest, more importantly, for your support of today's program and Clark College. We really appreciate you. This ends today's program. Until our next Clark College Foundation Alumni Relations presents, take care, stay safe, healthy, and well. Thank you and good day.